Derek Eaves uh, was, is unable to be with us uh, at this meeting, but he was one of the founders of the association. Uh, and for those of you who know your list of, of authors of the HCR20 was one of uh, the, the people behind that. Derek uh, quintessentially was a, an academically informed uh, and rigorous clinical leader who developed forensic services knowing the value of critical thought and clinical wisdom being uh, embodied in and having an active life within clinical services uh, as they developed and fostered uh, in the uh, services in British Columbia that fusion and partnership with academic critique and developing tools to uh, lead to better care of the people it's our job to serve. So this keynote address at each of our meetings uh, is themed around those issues of service development uh, and the uh, provisions of high quality services and integrating that uh, with critical clinical thinking. When we started to plan this meeting, I could think of nobody better uh, than Harry Kennedy to present uh, the Derek Eves lecture at this meeting. Harry uh, is an old friend. We go back uh, a little over 20 years, frighteningly close to 25, Harry, uh, and uh, the days back to the Maudsley. Uh, but uh, uh, Harry is the uh, consultant forensic psychiatrist, a professor and clinical director in Dublin. He has been involved with uh, research uh, on a variety of areas early on anger and irritability. I remember a lovely paper of yours in the early 90s from the British Journal uh, on that, Harry. Uh, but a, a, a very scholarly, integrative approach to understanding the problems and issues we face and in the way he has planned and directed clinical services and forensic mental health in Ireland has brought the uh, structured professional judgment, rigour and thought to the key decisions that we need to make as forensic uh, services and as forensic clinicians. And uh, you're going to be talking about that in relation to length of stay, Harry. Welcome to Toronto. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank, thank you very much, Sandy. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Um, Sandy's very generous in his introduction. Can I start, before I go any further, by thanking the organisers for what has been a really fas fascinating, and interesting and informative programme so far, and there's more of it yet to go today and uh, in, in the coming days. Can I thank particularly Stephen Hart and also the local organising committee, Sandy Simpson, Stephanie Penny, Porrick Darby, Jim McNamee, Teresa Greenbo, and Stephanie Fernan. Um, you've obviously put a huge amount of work into all of this. Um, I want to acknowledge the many people who've worked with me. So some of the data that I'll be talking about, some of the findings that I'll be talking about as we go on, can be attributed to many of these, uh, all of these people, and many others as well. Um, I'm really honoured to be asked to give the Derek Eves lecture. Um, Derek Eves is outstanding, essentially as a product champion, somebody who advocated for modern, progressive, rehabilitative and evidence-based forensic mental health services. Can I also mention uh, another prominent product champion for such services, Rudiger Müller Isperner, who's also not with us uh, this meeting. Um, Rudiger formed one of the early European limbs of the unique value of this particular association, which combines North America, Canada, and the European states, where similar services were evolving at, a, at the same time. And most of all, Chris Webster. Uh, there's an award for students just after this talk. Um, Chris, I, I, I hope, might be in the room somewhere. And Chris's main uh, claim to, to all our, our attention is simply that he's a role model for an entire generation of um, researchers and service leaders. The title for the, the, this morning's uh, talk is The Active Management of Length of Stay. Now, we're all accustomed to studies of risk of violence, but the risk of violence is not the only risk. Our patients are also at risk of suicide, of being victims of violence. They're at risk of accidents, neglect, exploitation, loss of their rights, as we heard yesterday morning. And I'm going to suggest to you that one of the greatest risks face, facing a patient who is admitted to a secure forensic hospital is the risk of a very long stay. 
Discovering the determinants of length of stay in forensic secure services would enable interventions to influence the length of stay. Now, the history of psychiatric hospitals um, includes within it the history of our forensic mental health services in relatively modern times. But this overall history has become a subgenre of pessimism, a sort of misery lit amongst the historians who see the history of psychiatric hospital care as a sort of folly of grandeur. And they have a fair point a lot of the time. Asylums, at their best, chose care and moral therapy over custody and coercion. They provided safety, light, air, nutrition, and access to nature, even when there were no other treatments. Asylums at their worst, though, arose from stigma, from eugenics, from the fear of moral imbeciles. They lacked therapeutic ambition, most of all. They became total institutions, and the total institutions were toxic in themselves, for the patients and for the staff. Now, the total institution is simply a name. It was coined by scholar academics, Goffman, Skull, and others. And the theory was extended to institutionalization, institutional neurosis by Brown and Burley in the Institute of Psychiatry in the 70s. So, a, a cultural question for you all. Is the history of psychiatric hospital care a history of steady decline from former glory, like Gibbon's decline and fall? Is it a history of steady progress from the monastic origins of the Bethlehem Royal Hospital to the state institutions, the Victorian asylums, and now the community networks of care, sort of Marxist onward and upward theory of history? Or, as I'm going to suggest to you, is it a history of a cycle, uh, a series of rise and fall and rise again? something we could attribute to Petrarch, a sort of 14th century poet who talked about, named the Dark Ages. We've come out of a dark age in mental health care, again, something Michael Perlin described um, yesterday morning, but perhaps another one isn't too far off. The history of psychiatric hospitals is a history of idealism and enlightenment followed by growth. Growth, however, means that the resources get stretched. So you have people like the Quakers in York founding um, a very enlightened progressive institution, which then, of its nature, leads to lots more such institutions. The numbers grow. And as they grow, the resources get stretched and the idealism gets stretched. You end up with decreased quality, dysfunction, scandals, adverse events, statutory inquiries, parliamentary committees, and then increased resources and reform and a turn of the cycle again. At their best, hospitals are therapeutic. They have a culture of care um, where the culture is orientated towards being interactive with the patients, thinking, feeling, planning, rewarding engagement, and looking to the future for social uh, adjustment, social gains, recovery. At their worst, they become prisons with the custodial culture that's distant, non-interactive, rewards conformity, and it's just orientated towards current conformity, good order and discipline. And there seems to be a cyclical relationship between these two, from high to low and back again. Now, if increased numbers, hospital places without increased resources, is the root cause of decline, then there are two possible explanations for this excessive and inappropriate admissions, um, and excessive inappropriate lengths of stay. So I'm going to talk briefly about each of these and what we might know about them. But just to recall where we are in this cycle of uh, pro progress and decline, at the moment, the most recent turn of this cycle was that from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s onwards, traditional psychiatric hospitals had fallen into such a state of decline that a new radical solution was chosen by those who had the political leadership of this. And the solution was simply to close them, do away with them. Now, decarceration was largely driven, it's probably fair to say, on economic grounds, although there was an argument about idealism which also fired it and fired it appropriately. Um, what we have now is community psychiatry but increasingly it's finding its cycle as well, 
and my colleagues who think about community psychiatry are now referring to it as outdoor psychiatry. Um, interestingly, the ethicists are also on a cycle, and their cycle has uh, peaked, I suppose, with the human rights vital importance of autonomy. But interestingly, again, as we heard from Michael Perlin yesterday, that's gradually shifting to a position where we put dignity even ahead of that. And quite what we're going to mean by dignity remains to be seen. Does it mean outdoor psychiatry? What we are getting, particularly in the forensic domain, is trans-institutionalization. So there is an argument uh, that those who, there has been a shift from the large asylums, which had custodial care, not very progressive care, to the prisons. Now, this is a well-known statistical fallacy, the fallacy of association, which is not causation. But Penrose, um, many years ago, showed a relationship, a reciprocal relationship, between the number of hospital beds and the number of prison places. This is the history of Ireland, which at one point had the highest rate of hospital detention in the world. We had, in 1960, 20,000 people in asylums. Also, in 1960, we had 300 prison places, one of the lowest imprisonment rates in the country. As you can see, the numbers have crossed in modern times. It's only a statistical association. There is no suggestion of cause and effect. But this is interesting. This is the number of admissions over much the same period of time. And what you see is that the number of hospital admissions has fallen quite a lot. And the number of prison admissions has actually risen uh, very, very closely to match that, which is interesting. Decarceration also led to the decline of the old national maximum security hospitals, for example, in, uh, in the UK, and the development of modern medium secure regional hospitals to fill the yawning gap between maximum security hospitals and community facilities. Now, these medium secure units have been established all across Canada, Australia, and all parts of Europe, really, in a blaze of success and idealism. Um, they are soft machines, engines for recovery. And the models for this, I think, can be traced to the TBS units in the Netherlands, the medium secure units in the UK, established by the Butler Report, and an interesting one, the Rheinische Klinik in Durham, which architecturally was more or less photocopied in, uh, in Melbourne and in Sydney. So, we're very interesting historical roots for what we are all working in now, looking around the room. Here's another historical route, though, for hospital care. This is the Ospedale Santa Maria della Scala in Siena. You have to excuse my poor Italian. And these murals describe the work of the hospital uh, in about 1400. What they show is the complete mixture between acute medicine, a surgeon treating a, a wound, and the care for orphans, for widows, for the sick and infirm and elderly, over on the left there, uh, and the giving of alms. So the concept, the modern concept of a hospital as a place where there is short-term acute intervention is not the full picture of health services everywhere. The majority of health services, including mental health services everywhere, have focused on chronic illness and disability. Um, not just in the community, but also in the hospitals. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that all hospitals are essentially organized along two principles, and this will be very familiar to all of you. They're organized according to provision for short-term and medium-term and longer-term uh, needs, and they also operate according to systems of stratification, according to needs and risks, both in the acute hospitals and the general psychiatric units that remain and in our forensic hospitals. So again, we stratify, we provide different facilities with high and medium and low levels of physical security, relational security, and procedural security. Um, the hospital where I practice places, because it has a very, very old building, which has long since been unfit for its purpose, it was opened in 1850, and is architecturally unchanged, so all the emphasis is on relational security, the ratio of staff to patients. And that's high on admission. It's still higher in a sort of medium-term intensive care unit. And then patients progress through medium secure units, and they continue to move along this pathway 
to rehab and pre-discharge units, and community units, where actually the staff-to-patient ratio is even higher than in the hospital, but there is no physical security of any sort. Um, this reflects the patient's needs. So along that same pathway, acute symptoms decline. The high point at the end there is the intensive care unit, which is really in the middle of the pathway. Risk, dynamic risk, is stratified in the same way, as you might expect. And the global assessment of function and any other measure of recovery that you can think of progresses and improves along the same pathway. What do we have now can I, in, in terms of services? Can I describe one of the, the most famous studies of the decarceration of patients into the community? And that was the closure of Freerin Hospital in 1993. Freerin was a traditional English asylum. At one point, it had over a 1,000 beds. And following its closure, the outcomes for the patients was very, very carefully studied. The last ward out of Freerin in 1993 was, in fact, the forensic ward. It was, I had been a, a very new, very wet behind the ears consultant there for about a year before I moved my patients to a new medium secure unit elsewhere in London. Six years later, a new steady state had, uh, had settled. And in a one night survey in November 1999, we were able to identify 1,085 hospital beds the majority of which were registered mental nursing home beds in the community. This is the distribution of lengths of stay, and if you can bear with me for two minutes, um, I want to tell you first of all about the length of stay across those units. So the mean length of stay across those 1,085 beds was 697 days, cross-sectionally. Length of stay is difficult to study, and we're not used to thinking about it, and the mean is not the appropriate measure for length of stay in this way. So the median is perhaps a better guide. The median length of stay was much shorter, 79 days. That's in the general beds. In the forensic beds, the mean length of stay was 2,200 days, and the median was 1,300 days. Very different. Now, that graph of length of stay that I showed you can be analyzed by mathematicians into a mixed exponential. Bear with me with this. The figures A, C, and E are ways of modeling the numbers of patients in short-term, medium-term, and long-term beds. And the exponential functions, minus B, minus D, minus E, give you a measurement of the half-life, or the median length of stay as a way of conceptualizing it in terms of mathematical models. And here's what you find is actually going on in that 1,085 beds. Half the beds are acute, and the average length of stay there is 50 days. 28% of the beds are medium term, and the average length of stay there is about a year and a half. And about a fifth of the beds are long term, and the average length of stay there is about 15 years. Now, about 6% of all admissions will become medium term, and less than 1% will become will become long-term. And you won't be surprised to hear that when you divide these into secure and open beds, very few of those acute beds, the PICU beds, um, are secure. About a quarter of the medium-term beds are secure, but more than half the long-term beds are actually secure. So in the new dispensation, the easiest way to get a new long-stay bed was to be a forensic patient or to be in a secure bed. Um, so the greatest risk facing a patient admitted to a secure forensic hospital is the risk of a very long stay. Increasing length of stay, as we've seen, leads to increasing bed numbers. And it's possible, to some extent, that risk aversion might contribute to this. And again, if increased numbers without increased resources is the root cause of decline, then there are two possible explanations. And again, just to repeat myself, excessive and inappropriate admissions, excessive and inappropriate length of stay. Can we discover the causes for these long lengths of stay? Because if we could, we could enable interventions to influence it. Is risk the answer? Now again, historical stuff that everybody is familiar with. In 1977, Scott, one of the founders of forensic psychiatry in Britain, quoted a colleague as saying that dangerousness is a dangerous concept. And he gave us this wonderful piece of 
COD algebra to define it. He said that dangerousness is the product of probability, risk, and gravity or seriousness of what is at risk. Two together give you this concept of dangerousness. So this is rather like the grave and immediate uh, definition for entry to secure hospitals, which guided us uh, in the 80s and 90s. You could also say that this is the combination of probability or risk and the aversiveness of that risk. What are the achievements of risk assessment in our everyday practice? They are many. So the HCR20, for instance, does predict inpatient violence. The HCR20 predicts community violence in patients released from hospitals. The HCR20 predicts failed transfers from high to medium security. These are all actually genuinely useful uh, things we learn from risk assessment. There are risks other than interpersonal violence. Um, the risk of suicide and self-harm. The Pareto patient, who is the revolving door patient, has many short admissions. And of course, prolonged length of stay. There are very interesting current questions about risk assessment. Jeremy Coyd um, is exploring a theme about item to outcome studies. Others have looked at this as well. There's an interesting question about whether multidisciplinary team rating is really the right way to go. Um, does it have good inter-rater reliability? And perhaps one of the most provocative pieces of writing in recent years, Andrew Carroll from Melbourne drew attention to the fact that the final SPJ risk rating is as good or better than the actuarial score as a predictor. What's all that about? So, the HCR20 predicts inpatient violence. These are areas under the curve and 95% confidence intervals. Um, the SAPROF predicts protection against violence. The SRAM, which is a risk assessment for suicide and self-harm, predicts violence. The Dundrum 3, which I'm obviously going to talk about later on, which is an assessment of treatment outcome, that predicts violence. The START, the Global Assessment of Function, which isn't a risk assessment instrument of any sort, um, and another measure of recovery. They're all actually pretty good using areas, uh, receiver operating characteristics. They're also actually pretty good predicting self-harm, even though only one of these instruments is designed to predict self-harm, but they are actually quite good at doing that. Um, what about the individual items? Does it matter if not all the items predict? For example, H1 previous violence does not predict violence for inpatients in a forensic unit because they're all positive. Does that mean it's no use rating it? It does not mean that. Um, again, major mental illness does not predict violence for inpatients in a forensic unit because they're all historically mentally ill. Does that mean we should drop it? No, it doesn't. Um, not all these items are actually significant predictors in inpatient settings, but they, they would be in community settings, perhaps, or other settings. Um, the dynamic items are all quite good, but they're not all equally good. If we did the sort of thing now that pure statisticians did and uh, entered all of this into a logistic regression equation, we'd find that two items in the HCR20 come into those models. Does that mean we should drop the other 18 items? I would suggest to you that it doesn't. Um, indeed, if you boil them all down, you come up with three items, um, which might be good actuarial predictors, but would be of very little practical help. Um, the validity of risk assessment should be more than accurately predicting risk. If a patient, for instance, is violent during follow-up after HCR20 assessment, is the violence caused by the risk factors that we actually identified beforehand or some other causative event or susceptibility? Should we be studying adverse life events and thinking about independent events and dependent life events? Here's one of those uh, predictors that I showed a minute ago, the global assessment of function, which actually is really good at predicting inpatient violence and inpatient self-harm. It has very little content. It's mainly just about an, a person's ability to cope, and to some extent, the way that might be related to symptoms. Perhaps, instead of thinking about risk, we should be considering the broader category of susceptibility factors. Risk factors increase probability. Protective factors decrease probability. Positive interactions between two risk factors, if they are greater than simply uh, additive or synergistic, and negative interactions, 
would be antagonistic. Now, in the valid, there's a paper by Michael Rutter, uh, one of the greatest child psychiatrists in recent times, working on resilience, who said that a protective factor is only truly protective if it has this enhanced interactive effect statistically. And we've been able to show this for the interaction between the SAPROF and the HCR20 dynamic items. So the SAPROF isn't just the opposite, the reverse of risk or the absence of risk. The SAPROF protects in the presence of risk. And this is quite informative about how we might design treatment plans. Um, so where do we look for guidance about these interactive effects. Well, the people I bump into most often in the academic department nowadays are geneticists. They regard a forensic psychiatrist as a, a sort of, uh, you know, entertaining eccentric who's never going to get a paper in nature. Um, but they, they like to hear the stories about our patients sometimes. They're very interested in this phenomenon, epistasis. Susceptibility factors may interact. For example, genetic polymorphisms and environmental exposures. This is obviously very central to how psychiatric illness works. In general, a statistical interaction arises when the effect of one explanatory variable depends on the particular level or value of another. Let me give you an example. These are two well-known susceptibility genes for Alzheimer's. One of them, BACE1, is protective when it occurs on its own. The other one, ApoE4, anybody who's done an MCQ recently will know carries an increased risk of Alzheimer's when it occurs on its own. The odds for the risk are 2.4. Now, if you had both of those genes and you were compared to people who had neither, the expected interaction is the product of those two odds ratios, which would be 1.78. Actually, when you find some, the people who have both genes and compare them to have neither, the actual odds ratio is much higher, it's nearly five. If you divide the actual odds ratio by the expected odds ratio, you get this, fact, this number, 2.8, which is the synergy factor. And this can be quite informative in trying to work out what risk factors mean. I'm going to show you the interactions between the items in the HCR20. And in each case, what I'm going to show you is the odds ratio of having both the risk factors combined with having neither. So um, the H2, H1, for example, as we've said, isn't a predictor. Young age at first violence. The thickness of the line gives you the odds ratio. So the heaviest line there connecting young age at first violence to impulsivity has an odds, ra odds ratio of four point, uh, 46. Um, relationship instability has several strong interactions, again, with impulsivity and with stress. Employment problems, substance misuse, major mental illness, which isn't a risk factor for inpatients. Um, early maladjustment has this very, very strong interactive effect, an odds ratio of 188 with impulsivity. Early maladjustment and impulsivity, not too surprising when you think about it. Personality disorder. Again, some strong interactions, personality disorder and impulsivity, personality disorder and being unresponsive to treatment, or prior supervision failure, which again has a few strong interactions. C1, lack of insight, interacts with a lot of things. It's a sort of nodal point, but they're not very strong interactions. Negative attitudes, stronger interactions with a lot of things. Active symptoms does have an effect, not the strongest of effects. Impulsivity, again, has a strong network of interactions. Being unresponsive to treatment, plans lack feasibility, exposure to destabilizers, um, financial and personal supports, non-compliance with remediation, a few very strong interactions there, for example, with employment problems and prior supervision failure. Um, not always intuitive, these. And perhaps the most interesting of all, this factor or five stress, which has very strong interactions with a range of other dynamic and historical risk factors. It's a sort of nodal point. So the HCR20 has multiple internal interactive relationships between these risk factors. These are probably specific to the population studied in patients in the Central Mental Hospital in Dublin, mainly men, mainly with severe mental illness. 
The patterns might provide a way of distinguishing between meaningful but unlikely risk formulations and likely formulations, whether they're meaningful or not. So stress, for instance, or five, is one of these several nodes of strong interactions. Impulsivity, early maladjustment, maybe others. Stress appears from its connections to be made up of self-generated, non-independent rather than independent life events and difficulties. Again, perhaps we should be paying much more attention to the social psychiatry literature of life events and difficulties. I keep going back to this because it's so interesting, because the GAF has very little content. It's all about coping, which may be the other side of the coin for stress. This is another interesting finding, um, which I hope we'll talk about next year um, and over the following times. We've started looking at the matrix measurement and treatment research to improve cognition and schizophrenia, cognitive battery, it's quite a mouthful. Um, and what we find is that it has two elements in it, neurocognition, which is a predictor of inpatient violence, but a weak predictor, and social cognition, which is a strong predictor of inpatient violence. So, validity is necessary for usefulness, but validity isn't sufficient for, for utility. We've learned to think of risk assessment not as an actuarial predictor, but as a needs assessment. We assess risk factors um, in order to allow us to draft care and treatment plans that are relevant to a person's individual needs. Um, now, do the risk assessments that we're using actually connect up well with care and treatment plans? I'd suggest they do, but there are ways of making that even more tightly linked. Um, could we, for instance, use SPJ instruments to generate an evidence-based risk formulation? Can we use that to plan and deliver treatment programs that are relevant to risk and the seriousness of the risk and would shorten length of stay? Here is a short history of needs assessment in mental health. Everything to your, to your right is forensic, but everything to your left is general psychiatry. The central point there, the Medical Research Council Social Behavioral Schedule, was written by John Wing, the Institute of Psychiatry, in the late 1960s. It was taken by Till Wykes uh, at the time of the closure of Freer and the other, the TAPS project, and, turn, and published as the Social Behavioral Schedule, and it in turn generated the Camberwell Assessment of Need, including the forensic version and other versions. John Wing himself, also starting from his Social Behavioral Schedule, developed the HONOS, Health of the Nation Scales, which I think will be familiar in lots of jurisdictions, lots of departments of health make us use it now. There's a secure version, there are other versions. The ring route, the, the circle line, is risk. And PCL is not really a risk, it's not an SPJ instrument, but it was related to the HCR20, and the HCR20 is the father of risk assessment in modern times. On the left, you've got the RSVP, the access, which I'll come back to, the SAPROF, START, and then over the other side in the general domains, suicide risk assessments like the SRAM and various screening tools used by triage nurses, which I think are terribly important and worth coming back to. Um, the, the, the central line running in red from left to right there covers these triage instruments, A&E triage instruments for suicide risk on the left and triaging the need for therapeutic security on the right, starting with Nigel Eastman's access tool, Jenny Shaw's SDT, the SNAP from Stephen Davies, and the Dundrum tool, which obviously I'm going to say a little bit about um, and hopefully not bore you all. Two other dimensions that are important here, the assessment of need, starting with quality of life uh, and, reco and recovery tools down to the left and up to the right on the forensic side, treatment completion and recovery from a forensic point of view. And then the, uh, the green line running top left to bottom right is assessment of capacity, capacity to consent to treatment on the general side, fitness to stand trial on the right. So I've shown you this before, risk and the aversiveness of the risk or the seriousness of the risk. And I want to talk about the way this would be related to excessive or inappropriate admissions. Modern forensic services were founded on reform, high quality services for a few highly selected patients. Selection is based not on risk, often the immediacy of the risk, 
is long gone by the time a patient is admitted to a forensic unit. It's based on the seriousness of the risk. So all hospitals customarily are organized into means of allocating patients to appropriate levels of care. An allocation within the hospital is a process of risk assessment and risk management. Tools for the assessment of need of therapeutic security prior to admission are a way of systematizing and communicating and teaching how we do this. They work only as part of an overall organizational system, some central admissions system for consistent prioritization within the service. And the same is true for moving out of the service from high to medium to low security. There are tools that enable us to do this, but they're really only useful if there is some central reviewing and consistency process, a governance process to make use of them. Um, so we're going to start looking at the tail end of this, this uh, airplane, the pre-admission and, and waiting list management uh, processes for coming into a forensic unit. These, we found, were the items that experienced clinicians took into account when deciding who they might admit to a forensic hospital. The seriousness of violence, the seriousness of self-harm, same thing for uh, immediacy of risk of violence or, or self-harm, specialist forensic need, the risk of absconding, the need to prevent access to drugs and weapons, public confidence issues, media interest, victim sensitivity, other issues about complex risk of violence requiring complex specialist treatments, institutional behavior, and the legal process itself. Um, so, a couple of quick validation studies. The first is three months in a busy remand prison, um, serving two-thirds of the population of Ireland. Um, 921 new receptions in the remand prison were screened, 246 were assessed. The easy thing is to distinguish who you want to transfer to a mental health service and who you don't want. This is like shooting fish in a barrel. But at a threshold score of 5.5, the sensitivity was 97%, the specificity was 91%. Not a magical achievement. A more interesting one, deciding of those who need to be moved out of the prison back into mental health services, how many can be looked after in the community or in an open ward, how many need to go to a PICU, an acute low secure unit, or to a medium, or high, um, a medium secure unit. 100 patients diverted over a period of years, 7,500 men screened, 1,400 men fully assessed, 100 of them diverted, 27 to open wards, 26 to PICUs, 47 to medium secure units. Um, that Dundrum 1 score certainly separates them out quite well, and the receiver, oper receiver operating characteristic works fairly well, comparing each with the next. So we have a structured professional judgment instrument for describing how clinicians decide who should be admitted to which level of therapeutic security. Each item has been tested. You'll be interested to know that the suicide items don't work, but we leave them in despite the fact that they don't work because we do sometimes take it into account. Again, item to outcome validity isn't the only reason for having something in an SPG, SPJ tool. What other validity would be useful? Now, there is no gold standard for these decisions, but what would be interesting, for example, what would be useful would be if we could predict length of stay at the point of admission. So here is um, new work. This is mainly Mary Daverin's work. 269 sequential admissions to the National Forensic Mental Health Service in Dublin. Um, mean score on the Dundrum 2.3, which means that the mean is higher than a PICU average. The mean length of stay up to now, 244 days. The median length of stay, 56 days. Even in forensic services, a lot of people come and go middlingly quickly. Um, here are survival curves for each of the items. So seriousness of violence, the more serious the violence, the longer you stay. Suicide has no effect on length of stay. The immediacy of the risk of violence on admission does influence length of stay, but not the immediacy of the risk of self-harm. Specialist forensic need, certainly influences length of stay, the risk of absconding, but the preventing of access, for some reason, doesn't seem to influence length of stay. I think that's interesting. 
Victim sensitivity, though, has a big effect on length of stay. The more there is media awareness, the more active a campaign by victims, the longer you're going to stay. No surprise. Complex risks, the need for long-term treatments, obviously influences length of stay. Institutional behavior has a weak effect. Those who are riotous in prison, which is what this item mainly rates, aren't necessarily the most difficult to look after in a psychiatric hospital. Legal process, I'm delighted to say, had very little effect, um, but I spent a lot of my time explaining to lawyers why they can't always get what they want. There's a, Michael Perlin quoted um, J Bob Dylan a lot yesterday. I'd be quoting the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want. Um, and indeed, the predicted legal outcome at the point of admission, that's a very strong predictor of length of stay. Um, okay. If increased numbers without increased resources is the root cause of decline, then there are two possible explanations for this. And the other one I want to look at is excessive and inappropriate length of stay. Now, if recovery is the process of progression towards independence and autonomy, moving to a less secure place or the community, how can we measure progress? How can we measure recovery? How do we know when to take a risk or whether we're actually taking enough risks? Now, I, I got in very jet-lagged to Toronto on Tuesday uh, and went to the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is 10 minutes from here, where there's an exhibition of the work of both Francis Bacon and um, Moore, the sculptor Moore. I can't represent it to you highly enough. This caught my eye. Bloomsday was Monday. Um, and this is obviously Bacon's attempt at a portrait of James Joyce. In Ulysses, James Joyce wrote about this hospital. There's a chapter which is usually referred to as the Oxen of the Sun, um, and this is the National Maternity Hospital, Hollis Street, and he describes a bunch of medical students um, waiting for things to happen with a bunch of fathers-to-be. Um, the National Maternity Hospital is remarkable because of another product champion, uh, Kieran O'Driscoll, who was famous for doing wonderful um, controlled trials of interventions. He would take a thousand primigravidae and see what influenced good outcomes. Naturalistic observational studies with interventions on a very, very limited but ethical basis. And he coined this term the active management of labor, which consisted simply of defining the onset, and it's very easy to define the end of labor, and setting achievable goals, setting a timeline and intervening only when those goals were not being met as time progressed. It enabled him to guarantee safe deliveries for a much larger number of women and babies. Um, so, can we have an active management of length of stay? The two instruments that, that we use to measure these outcomes and to drive things forward are the Dundrum 3, which measures program completion, and the Dundrum 4, which is a recovery item. I should say there are other Item, there are other scales that might be of relevance in this. I mentioned earlier the HONA Secure, uh, the SNAP. Um, it, any and all of these may be useful. When we're making decisions about moving a patient from high to medium and onto low levels of therapeutic security, or discharging patients to the community, clinicians are likely to take more than risk assessment alone into account. We take other things into account. Um, for example, completing therapeutic groups to address the risks that so that people are ready for discharge. So we're now up the front end of this plane and thinking how we turn our assessments into treatment plans and how we know when we've achieved them. We have simplified our approach to treatment. We talk about there being five treatment programs in the hospital, and I expect this is pretty much what people do um, in all similar hospitals. So there is a program for physical health. There's no mental health without physical health. There are obviously programs for wellness, but these are mainly about teaching people to look after their own mental health. Drugs and alcohol, because 70% of our patients have serious drugs and alcohol problems, and it's the most remediable risk factor. Harmful behaviors, obviously, and psychosocial functioning more generally, um, which we divide into self-care and activities of daily living, education, occupation, creativity, and family and social networks. Now, when we had worked out how we could rate these things, we still felt that there were other things clinicians take into account when recommending 
transfer or discharge. And they were very straightforward things like stability, insight, rapport and working alliance, and the use of leave. This is how we test out how well we have confidence in the patients and how much the patients have confidence in us. And of course, the dynamic risk items and victim sensitivity issues, which still have an important external effect on the progress of the individual patient. The ratings for these didn't drop from the sky. They derived from other theories about treatment uh, and progress and recovery. Let me give you some quick results for how we think this is working. Uh, a 12-month prospect of study, 86 inpatients at varying levels of therapeutic security in the Central Mental Hospital. Um, what we found was that more or less everything predicted positive moves to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, the GAF, for instance, works quite well. But when you adjust for the HCR20 to see what is added value on top of the HCR20 dynamic items, we found that actually it was the Dundrum 1, which we didn't expect at all. So it's the old formula. Risk and the seriousness of the risk influences people when taking a chance on moving someone from high to medium uh, to low security. Going backwards, if things get out of hand, are the same factors and also symptoms. But what about actually making the recommendation to a review board to discharge, and indeed the review board themselves agreeing to discharge somebody? What influences that? Well, again, lots of things influenced it. Um, this time, the only thing that didn't influence it was the seriousness, the Dundrum 1 score that brought somebody in in the first place. So clinicians and review boards are quite properly able to set that aside if there is other evidence of progress and treatment completion, recovery, global function, all are very good predictors of who would be discharged and who wouldn't, along with risk assessment instruments and symptom measurements as well. Are these measurements sensitive to change? So the next study, what we've taken is all the patients in, in the same forensic hospital who appear before the Mental Health Review Board. Our system for driving things forward is that I ask my colleagues to make these assessments every six months and append them to their reports to the review board. This is a great discipline. It means that there is an evidence basis for the opinions that c clinicians offer to review boards. That means that I get tons of data that I can come along here and talk about. Um, seriously, this is how, how we might practice in an evidence-based way. What, how do you measure change? Well. Interestingly, it's not something we do a lot. You could do paired t-tests. There are statistical problems with that. A better way of doing it is to measure effect size adjusted for paired uh, measurements. And what you find is that for people who had been in the hospital below the median, below five years, there are reasonably good positive effect sizes over a 12-month period. Change in the HCR20 is positive. For those who have been in the hospital more than five years, if anything, people go backwards. You certainly don't see progress after five years. Treatment completion, again, you get really quite gratifying positive effect sizes for all those in the hospital less than five years, but negligible or even negative uh, effects for those in the hospital over five years. And the other measurement of recovery, um, again, very positive effects less than five years, and actually some positive effects over five years as well. There may be some sequencing of effects here. People begin to show evidence of stability and more insight and to use leave towards the end of five, five years or into the early years after that. So, it is possible to identify clinical factors to ensure the rigorous selection of those admitted to a secure forensic hospital. And we have a very important duty to be vigilant gatekeepers. It would be very wrong to admit somebody to a secure hospital and deprive them of a lot of liberty who didn't need it. The same factors, interestingly, seem to predict length of stay. And it may be that other things will predict length of stay as well. Clinicians and review tribunals decide when a patient is ready to move to a less secure place or to the community. And they decide this based on risk and on program completion and evidence of recovery mostly actually increasing rapport and trust, which is a kind of unifying 
meaning for those, those risk factors. Um, there's little additional benefit from formal treatment beyond five years, though there is some evidence of continuing recovery beyond five years, and limited evidence for that. The limiting factor is likely to be cognitive impairment, with impairment of neurocognition and social cognition, risk factor also for violence in its own right, possibly an underlying and mediating fa factor. A recovery orientated goal for the dangerous patient who is impaired in their mental capacities would be to progress them to community placements that have high relational therapeutics intensity, but no physical security. That really ought to be achievable for almost every patient. The placement, though, should be sustainable over time, not a revolving door placement. I'm going to finish um, with this. Roman houses commonly in the entrance hall had a mosaic showing the labyrinth and somebody slaying the minotaur, which I'm not going to go into at all. The asylums, before their fall, came to resemble labyrinths, easy to get into, impossible to get out of, a maze, a prison, um, and the destroyer, indeed, of, of youth and health. What people needed, of course, was Ariadne's thread, a way to get out. And that's still pretty much what we need. Um, I hope there's some evidence-based ways of doing that. And can I just mention, in finishing, the EU cost action, IS 1302, which is mainly interested in assessing the significance of and the needs of longer-term forensic patients and what we can do to improve their lot. Thanks.